Uh, Pastor Dr. Donna Coltrane Battle needs no introduction in the civilized world. Uh, that is the way. Um, she uh, has been a great gift to us and for many years has served as uh, a really a, a, a pastoral um, uh, bedrock and, and anchor for our congregation. Uh, she is in North Carolina. And the, she is the uh, life partner and of uh, Brother Dedrick Battle, who we've already mentioned, and they have uh, three beautiful children uh, that did not make the trip, uh, sadly, to my daughters. Amen. They wanted to see them, but, um, but we're so grateful to have Pastor uh, Donna here. So why don't we all stand and put our hands together, and let's clap our hands for the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, Pastor Donna Battle. Amen. I give God thanks and praise to be among my family again. When I say that I have missed y'all, that's an understatement. Amen. And I know we, we in a time crunch, so I won't belabor the point, but um, please know how deeply my heart swells in this moment as we lean into um, such a celebratory moment. Um, as a woman, a black woman in ministry, who has tread this path for over two decades now, um, who has walked in this way, it is no small thing to come to a moment where a sister can be affirmed, edified, and um, consecrated for the work that God has called her to. And so this is sacred ground, and it's not something that I take lightly. But let's lean into the word, amen? Um, our scripture this morning is a portion of our lectionary text. We're going to look at the gospel according to John, starting at verse 14. We're just going to read a few verses down to 21. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake and where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. Or Capernaum. And by now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. And then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they had been heading. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. To follow Jesus, to follow Jesus. Let's pray for a moment. God, we give you thanks and praise that as we have been some 18 or more months outside of the presence of one another, we have never been outside of the presence of you. And so God, the same spirit that carried our four parents, God, you are carrying us now. And so God, we ask that you permeate this place in every way and permeate our hearts and our souls, attune our ears and our minds, God, such that we might encounter you first individually and then collectively as your church, that this may be a precipice, a turning point, a new vision for where you are leading us as your church and specifically the Way Christian Center. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So it isn't often that we really get a chance to look deeply at the leadership of Jesus, the spiritual leadership of Jesus. But of course, this occasion gives us the perfect opportunity to do just that. This idea that Jesus was and is the savior of the world, but to the disciples, he was more than that. He was a friend, he was a rabbi, a teacher, a guru even. And that's a term we often use or hear in like Hindu and Buddhist traditions, but um, bu um, guru is a Sanskrit word that means weighty. That the leadership of Jesus carried the spiritual weight necessary for times such as these. 
in her catechism, this time where we listen to the doctrine and the theology of a candidate who was being ordained, um, Pastor Nisha says that she models her leadership after Jesus, that she models her leadership after the weightiness, the spiritual weightiness of our Savior. And so my hope is that as we look at this passage for a few moments, that we will begin to come back to what it means to follow Jesus. Following is no, uh, no, no lightweight business. Who we follow matters. Amen? Because where they will lead us matters. And so we're going to lean into this as we as a church really stand at an evolutionary point, as the world stands at an evolutionary point, that we might be open to how God may be inviting us to follow in a new way. Jesus and his disciples have just fed the 5,000 plus people. And the people seeing this, all of those there witness that not only proximity to, just, um, to Jesus brings abundance, but that if we are willing to receive from Jesus, as our good friend, the Reverend Dr. Shanika Walker Barnes shared with us, that if we are willing to receive from Jesus, we also have access to abundance. And this thing was so big, them feeding so many without going to the market, without harvesting food from the field, that the people were astounded. They were excited. They were um, enthralled to the extent that they decided they wanted to press Jesus into the role they had for him. They thought that, oh, this is the one, this is the prophet who is coming to the world, and I think that, you know, we should make him our king, not ask him to be our king, not invite him to stay, but even if by force, we're going to force you to do what we want. They were leaning back into this very empire, kind of imperialistic idea that this is the only way our nation can get back on task, is that if we have a king that got your kind of power, and so Jesus, discerning that these people were about to overtake him and force him to do something that he was not called nor created to do, he withdrew. And so the disciples, they waited. And when evening came, they went on down to the lake. They got in the boat and they began to cross the lake to Capernaum. And while they were crossing the lake, strong winds came and troubled waters came and the waves came. And while they are managing and navigating what is happening, they rode about three or four miles and they look up and they see Jesus walking on the water, right? And here we see they are afraid. He's walking on the water. They're afraid. Jesus dispels their fear. He says, it's me. He announces himself. We had a moment like that the other day, Pastor T, right? You know when you in your house and you ain't expecting nobody to come in? You better announce yourself. <laughs> hey, who that? <laughs> right? Who that? Hello? Jesus like, oh, it's just me. It's just me. <laughs> Calm down. Don't be afraid. And it says that in that moment, when they recognize it's Jesus and they're willing to let Jesus in the boat, they reach their destination. So to follow Jesus, the first thing we want to look at that what it means to follow Jesus as we see in this passage is that it's going to mean rejecting the controlling and dominant powers in order to evolve into who we are intended to become. We must reject dominant power in order to evolve into who we are intended to become. You all, Jesus came into this world to chart a new order, to um, create kingdom, not empire, right? Jesus was the savior. Jesus, um, in Jesus itself, was both human and divine, but Jesus was also expansive and boundaried, right? Jesus was all of these things, but what Jesus was not was controlling oppressive, right? Demanding, right? Jesus was invitational. He was assertive. He was clear, but he did not demand or control people in any way. He always invited folk into who he was and what he was doing. 
Now, I know we don't have time to go into it today, but I don't think it's a surprise to anyone in this space to know that we live in a society, a world even, that is um, very much under the grips of dominant control. This idea that we must control the masses in order to um, heighten or make life easier for the few, right? Many of my friends actually hate the term minority. And they hate it, um, not just because it underscores an experience that many people have that are considered the minority, that we are treated as less than, but they said it's not really accurate, that when we look globally, people of color are not the minority. Amen? That we actually outnumber those who don't identify as such. And so we live in a space where people are trying to constantly control and demand that we yield to their way in order to make their life better. But there is something else more dangerous that I see creeping up in this passage than that. And that is that when we look at this passage, what we see is that those of us who live and breathe in this work and in this society, we can internalize the same practices. That we too, under the guise of um, good naturedness or doing the right thing, can begin to take on practices of wanting to control and demand that people do things our way or we want to um, control them or violently press them to do it. We manipulate in ways, right? And if we aren't careful to guard against this, it can actually stop the evolutionary process of who we are intended to become. Early in my ministry experience, very early in my ministry experience, I went to work um, for a church and uh, while I was there, because who I was and the position that I was in was brand new, people didn't adjust well to it. And what I found was that even though I was responsible for several areas within the church, there were those who, um, every time I made a decision over the areas I was responsible for, would go to those in power above me. And those in power would then decide that they were going to change my decisions in order to acquiesce to those in the space. Now, the problem was this, I didn't lose responsibility. And so I was put in a place that actually became a very oppressive and stressful place to serve and to work because even though um, I had responsibility, I didn't have the authority to make the decisions necessary to do the work I needed to do. So others were um, able to make the decisions, but if it failed, I was held responsible. This is one of many common ways that it doesn't appear to be like dominant power, but that is exactly what is at work. I am trying to control you, but I want to take away any responsibility from myself, right? So not only are you subjected to my control, but when it all fails, I also blame you. Dominant power, y'all, it seeps in, it grows, right? It festers. And it shows up in every area of our life, not just in the church or in our jobs, but in our families, right? In our relationships, in our friendships. The people in this passage were not government officials. They weren't high political officials, y'all. They were everyday folk like us. All they did was drink the Kool-Aid, right? They weren't high up on this social um, ladder that we often talk about in terms of, you know, principalities and high places. These were everyday, ordinary folk wanting to literally control Jesus. Y'all, we have got to be able to name this, to see it, and to shift it when necessary because otherwise it will stop the evolution of who we are. First Corinthians 13, that famous passage on love says that love, what, does not insist on its own way. Dominant power is the antithesis of that. Dominant power, by definition, is to insist, even if violently, in your own way. And what is the implications of something being the antithesis of love? Is not God love? And so if you are the antithesis, the opposite, of love, then you are the opposite of God. So really we're talking about here, if we are not leaning into recognizing when we um, are either um, uh, participating in dominant power or seduced by dominant power, if we don't do that, we become the antithesis of God against God. And so then the question becomes, what do we do? 
We follow Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Jesus withdrew. He was like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> to the left. Jesus withdraws, right? Not into isolation by himself, not, you know, to this place where he is just um, sheltered in, but he turns away from the controlling dominant powers of the world towards the power of all creation, God. He grazes in the glory of God, turns back to the one. You are when we are struggling against injustice, struggling against pain, struggling against the dominant forces of this world, we must know when to withdraw and turn to face the God who reminds us of who we are, that we are not just loved by God, but that we are created in the image of that God. Y'all, we are created in the image of love. That means our very essence is to reflect love. He withdraws. And that too is what we must do. We must be able to withdraw. Do not take it lightly that the other time we see this happening to Jesus, this seduction of dominant power is in the wilderness after his baptism during his time of fasting. And what is so important about that time? That is the time of Jesus's consecration, his ordination per se, of being able to do ministry in this world. That's the last time he was tempted and or seduced or sought to be forced by Satan in the wilderness towards this dominant kind of false power. We must resist because if we don't, we deny not only our humanity, but our God. The second thing we see is that to follow Jesus means that we must be willing to do what we know to do in seasons of withdrawal. We must be willing to do what we know to do in seasons of withdrawal. So you all, the disciples were here waiting for Jesus. Jesus has withdrawn. And it may um, initially appear that, you know, they kind of just went down to the lake and went on their own. It looked like they may have been impatient and they just went out. And then when they got out there, they got in rough waters and got in trouble. It could appear that way. But when we take another look at this passage, we find something else. It says that the disciples waited till evening. And the word that's translated here as evening isn't just late in the evening, it's actually the 12th hour and later. Now you all, in the parable of the vineyard, what we find is that the 11th hour is um, presented as the last possible hour before things can shift. So here we see that the disciples didn't just wait, right, waiting for Jesus to draw near before they crossed the lake. They were waiting and they possibly waited past the point of wisdom. They waited past the 11th hour into the 12th hour and beyond. This was the moment at which you could not wait anymore. They had to make a decision, right? So it, it appears as if they were actually very faithful in their desire to have Jesus draw near, to be led by Jesus, right? You all, there are unquestionably seasons in our life where we are seeking God and we can't feel God where we are met with silence, right? And sometimes these are wilderness seasons and sometimes it's just around a specific kind of thing, right? We're praying and wanting God to guide us around a decision and we feel like we can't get clarity, right? We feel like it's just silence, right? But here we see that the disciples, when waiting from this, in this period of withdrawal where it feels like God is distant and withdrawn, they continue to do what they know to do. They did not have clarity as to when Jesus was coming, but they said, you know what? We have reached a point and passed it. So we got to do what we know to do, and we're going to what? Trust God. We're going to trust God to show up and do what God does. They were being faithful, yeah. faithful, y'all. So it wasn't just, you know, we're going to go, right? Now, this is very different from, I'm going to do what I want to do, and then I'm going to ask God to bless it. That ain't what we're talking about here, <laughs> right? I mean, we're talking about these seasons where it feels like, you know, I have done every single thing I can, and I just can't seem to hear clearly from God, right? These are the moments we're talking about. 
These are the moments where we aren't shying away from accountability, which is steeped in relationship, right? But we're trying everything we can to be accountable and still aren't hearing anything. They get in the boat, they cross, and they hit rough waters. And y'all, this, this is a scary place to be. When you've done all you can to hear from God, you feel like you haven't or God is still distant, and then you make the best possible decision you can, and then you hit troubled waters, it makes you um, at least um, very skeptical, right? You begin to um, get weary and uncertain about your, your process, right? And then you may even, the longer you stay in it, begin to form doubt, right? And here's where we find the disciples. It may appear as if Jesus came walking on water right away, but he didn't. They got out in those waters, y'all, and Jesus still didn't show up. How do we know? It says three or four hours they rowed. They were rowing for three or four hours in strong winds and rough waters, right? The rowing community um, kind of agrees that to row one mile is about an hour. So we're talking about at least four hours and in um, troubled waters that may even double. One professional rower says the best way to navigate troubled waters is not to, <laughs> to watch your weather and don't get in it. Why? Because he says it tires you out very, very quickly. So by the time Jesus does show up, and Jesus does, but by the time Jesus shows up, you all, they are exhausted. They are weary. They are tired. But, and Jesus has taken his sweet time, but he shows up. Okay? Jesus has taken his sweet time, but he shows up. Right? And this is what's so important, is that when we have done all that we know to do, we are now trusting that when God shows up, all things will work for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to God's purpose. You all, Jesus shows up and he shows up past the time that they thought salvation was possible. They are past that point where they think this thing can shift. You've reached that point, that point where you're like, uh-uh, I'm past it. It can't shift, it can't change, it can't move. Now don't get me wrong, I know there are things in our life that we need to let go of, we need to grieve and heal, I get that. But I'm talking now about the things we must fight for in life. I'm talking about the, the moments we must do things to survive. That when you hit that point where you say, no, it can't shift anymore, don't you stamp impossibility on that thing. The 11th hour is not God's last hour. They were past the 12th hour, y'all. You talk to any elders who've been through some stuff, they will, they will sing to you the words of Fred Hammond late in the midnight hour. God's going to turn it around. It's going to work in your favor. Fred, was, he was tapping on that thing. He said late in the midnight hour, that's 12, one hour past. One hour past the point of our ability to make this thing shift. They were in these waters doing what they knew to do, and Jesus showed up. But when Jesus showed up, this is what's so crazy. That's the moment they were afraid, which takes us to our last point, to follow Jesus means being willing for the bounds of possibility to be stretched beyond your imagination. To be willing for the bounds of possibility to be stretched beyond your imagination. I don't know that we spend enough time on Romans 12 too that says be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So that you can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Right? That so many of our decisions, so much of our thought process is in the unconscious, not the conscious. That we don't necessarily spend enough time bringing the, the things that we do unconsciously and all the behaviors that are based upon our unconscious into our consciousness so that transformation can happen. Now you all, we have come out of um, a really rough presidential season, 
right? And I know we, we starting to breathe a little bit. We can't let up fully, but we, we starting to breathe a little bit. And that's because we saw firsthand what it looks like for people to believe something is not true or impossible. And to no matter how much proof you got, you still don't believe, right? That what's before you is true, right? This idea that if we believe something is impossible, there is no way we can have all the evidence before us. If we're not even open to something being possible that we believe is impossible, it's like trying to look through a closed door. Can't change your mind. In the 16th century, the Western world got its first taste by, um, from a monk and a priest by the name of Copernicus, he um, kind of presented this radical idea that, that we are not the center of the universe here on earth, right? He presented this very radical idea that the earth, like all the other planets, revolve around the sun, right? And it was scandalous, y'all. Even reformers like Martin Luther saw it as scandalous and against scripture, right? That he would, he would even um, um, hint at the fact that we want the center of the world's universe. Right? But there was a man who took it even further. His name was um, Giordano Bruno. He was also a monk, a Dominican monk. And he says, no, Copernicus, you didn't go far enough. This was a man who sought to, um, to really learn as much as he could about the God of creation. And he began to read books that the church at the time had actually um, banned. And what he discovered in one of those books was this idea that the universe was actually as, um, was boundless and infinite. And that resonated with him because his idea of God was boundless and infinite. And he says, you know what? It makes sense to me that if our God is boundless and infinite, that the universe, all creation then would be boundless and infinite. So of course he started raising his voice. Hey y'all, we didn't miss it. what they do? They kicked him out. They kicked him out of his monastic order. Then he goes out, he continues to search, he has a vision, and in his vision, he sees that all of the stars that we see in the sky are actually little suns, right? And that our universe is one among many universes. And so he began to evangelize, but this was his gospel of evangelism. He says, I want people to know that your God is too small. He started to evangelize, your God is too small. He was nearly excommunicated from every church in the West, y'all. He finally returns home to Italy, is in prison for eight years, and eventually is put to death. Most of his books burned. And that's because the dominant powers of the church at the time felt like their power was being threatened. They did not have the imagination nor did they believe that what he was speaking was possible. To the extent that the, how sure they were around what was possible and what was not killed this man. 10 years later, another man by the name of Galileo looked into this brand new apparatus called a telescope and discovered that Bruno had been right. Discovered that he had dreamed, had seen the unimaginable. Y'all, these disciples saw Jesus walking on water, something they believed to be impossible, and they were afraid. And I get it. And I mean, I think you get it, right? I mean, like, we got this inscription. If I see somebody walking on water, I'm still going to be scared. <laughs> Truth be told. So on one hand, there's this understanding, there's this reminder in this text that what God calls us to, right, that what God is inviting us to is so much greater, so much bigger than us that it is. It is scary and terrifying. We've all been there, right, that what God imagines for us is nowhere near how small we imagine things for ourselves. And when we get a glimpse of it, it just, oh, oh my God, I'm scared, right? Let me take a step back. Woo, that's a bit too much. Calm that down, God. Calm that down. That's an easy concept to grasp. But y'all, their fear of seeing Jesus walk on water wasn't necessarily what stumped me in this passage. What stumped me was the fact that they didn't fear the strong winds and the raging water. John is somewhat of a rogue gospel, as in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. And what does that mean? That means that 
These are the Gospels where um, they give slightly different versions of the same accounts. John don't do that. John like, oh, I'm on my own, right? So in the Synoptic Gospels, there is an account that all, most of us are familiar with where they're on the Sea of Galilee, a storm rises, right? And um, there are 10 foot waves, right? Jesus is on the boat. Jesus speaks peace to the storm and calms it right? This is not what's happening in John's gospel. You all, this is very different. A storm doesn't rise. There aren't like 10 foot waves, right? There isn't like a beginning and an end. These disciples go in for the long haul, right? They have this consistent um, um, troubled water that they are navigating. And it had me start to think, were they not afraid of the troubled water because they were very accustomed to navigating troubled water? Was it their norm to be caught in strong wind and troubled water, to the extent that it was more familiar to them to navigate troubled water than it was to see avenues of peace. Y'all, compacted, ongoing trauma, right, in our lives can make these kinds of troubled waters our norm in such a way that what should shake us just a little bit and turn us towards God. No, we so used to navigating it because of the brokenness of this world that we just, we, we, we cool with that, right? We cool with that. That we actually miss seeing Jesus altogether or we dismiss when we do see Jesus because how Jesus is appearing is so far beyond the bounds of our imagination that we can't wrap our heads around it. We aren't poised to see something. We are just in survivor mode. That's where we are, folk. That's where we are. Christian mystic, spiritual guru, Howard Thurman, um, once wrote and said um, something along the lines, it'll come up in a minute, but I'm going to paraphrase. He said this, he says, look, he says, there are always opportunities popping up for transformation, but for those with their backs against the walls, those of us who struggle regularly, we often are unable to cooperate with those points of transformation because we are um, stunted in our like intellectual and spiritual selves, such that we often confuse caution for fear and fear for caution. Right? We get to these places where we aren't able to tell the difference. He says, but when your um, mind is free and your spirit unchained, right, then we can start to, to move in ways that create change. Y'all, this is where we are. Jesus was walking on water so far beyond the possibility of what they could ever imagine. Jesus was walking on the water and he comes to them and he eliminates their fear. They get scared when they see their salvation, okay? He says, no, don't be afraid. And they got two choices. They can either embrace Jesus, right? And let Jesus in, or they can resist Jesus and say, no, that's still impossible. My mind is playing tricks on me, right? They choose to embrace Jesus. And look at what the passage says. It says, the moment they are willing to let Jesus in the boat, they reach their destination. Y'all, Jesus doesn't even have to get in the boat. Jesus don't even have to get in the boat. All they have to do is be willing to let him in. We have been in the midst of a global pandemic for 18 months. We've seen over 4 million people die, many of whom are our family members. Y'all, we have been rowing in troubled waters long before we reach this point. We are tired and we are really pushed to the max. We are seeing trauma and pain rise up as gun violence across the cities. And it's not being met with the things that will make us whole. It's being met with the same punitive empire type um, processes that will continue to be punitive. We are not at a place where we feel like we can see. We think we're at the 11th hour. We're at the 11th hour. God, we're passing that point. How are you going to show up? And I am saying to you, if you are in a place where your family is hovered by these dark clouds, the people you love, it feels like the life and the hope is sucking out of them at steadying rates. I want you to know that to follow Jesus means to be able to garner the courage to look up and see this terrifying possibility that Jesus might be walking on the water, might be defying what you even know is possible that Jesus is saying, come to me, calm down, do not be afraid. 
that what Jesus is calling us to is so terrifying that you recognize that the only way you can live it out, the only way you can live out this terrifying call because it's so big is to listen for the voice of Jesus. It is to continuously invite God in. God of glory, we give you thanks and praise that you do not abandon even when it feels like you have. God, we give you thanks and praise that you are a God who presses beyond the bounds and the limitations, God, as possible. That when we've reached our breaking point, God, when we've reached the point where we think we are past the point of salvation, God, you show up and you turn the tide. So God, whatever needs to be broken up in the hearts and the minds of your people in this space today, we are trusting and believing that you're doing that by the power of your spirit. God, wherever it is that we need to um, be open, almighty God, to move beyond the bounds of what we believe is possible, God, we trust that you are doing this in this space. God, whatever we need to do to follow you, almighty God, we are trusting that you are doing that in this space right now. So whatever the needs of your people are, God, we trust you. That as we walk, God, to lay our hands on one among us, God, as we walk, God, to anoint her, God, and as we walk, God Almighty, um, to affirm her call, that the presence and the power of your spirit will move in ways that we never thought possible. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and believe these things to already be done. So it is and so it shall be. Amen. <laughs>